p.m. Let's pledge our allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible. indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Hey, Jeff, this is Greg. Guys, uh, am I unmuted? Yes, you're unmuted. You're on. Okay. It's All right. We're good. I'm just on the phone for maybe a half hour, and then I'll, uh, I'll log into the video when I get home. Okay. Hey. Very good. Uh, we're about to do roll Thank call. All righty. I'm on. <laughs> okay. Right. Chairman Jeff Duncan. Here. Vice Chair Stephanie Youngblood. <clears throat> Greg Obranovich? Yes, here. David Ring? Here. Maureen Valley? Here. Lorraine Theobald? Here. And I think that's everyone. Okay. All right. So now it's time for committee comments for items not on the agenda. Anyone have any uh, comments for anything that's not on tonight's agenda? Okay. Seeing none, uh, what about public comment? Is there any public out there? Okay. Seeing no public, uh, we will uh, need to adopt the agenda. So can I get a motion and a second? I move to adopt the agenda. Who is that? Oh, thanks Maureen. Second. All right. Okay. Jeff Duncan. Yes. Stephanie Youngblood. Here. Greg Obranovich. Here. David Ring. Yes. Maureen Valley. Yes. And Lorraine Theobald. Yes. Okay. Right. So now we need to approve the minutes, the consent agenda for April 1st, 2021. Can I get a motion and a second? Oh, do we, I'm sorry, I skipped the public comment. Do we still have, no, okay, good. I mean, I'm not saying it's good. But... <laughs> I, mean, I need a motion for the consent agenda. I move. All right, a second? Second. Thanks. Okay, let's see. Jeff Duncan? Yes. Stephanie Youngblood? I, I'm here. Yeah. My computer. <laughs> Greg Obranovich? Yes. David Ring? Yes. Maureen Valley? Yes. And Lorraine Theobald? Okay, so now we're ready for committee matters and a recap of the input to date. Take it away, guys. Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight. Stephanie, I, I feel your pain with computer issues. <laughs> and at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, our technical staff team of Matthew Gerken and Suzanne McFerrin uh, from AECOM. Thank you, Mary Beth, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thanks for entertaining a short presentation. I'm now going to attempt to share my screen with you. Uh, it usually takes me a couple times, but uh, <laughs> here goes nothing. Do you, let's see, do you see um, an introductory slide at the bottom says May 6, 2021? Yes, yep. All right. Hey, I'm getting a little better at this. All right. Thank you. I'm Matthew Gherkin from AECOM. I'll provide a short presentation followed by a Q&A as per usual. This evening, we're going to review the input uh, today, as the mayor just mentioned. 
Uh, and then we're going to start to talk about um, considerations for this general plan update in the area of air quality, greenhouse gases, and energy. We're going to review the existing uh, goals and policies, talk about gaps, talk about opportunities to address um, trending topics or, or address those gaps, and then go over next steps. So first, to recap the input to date, um, so in addition to our first meeting, uh, we also got input on some air quality, greenhouse gas energy topics as a part of the November open house meetings. Remember those meetings where it was very cold and we were standing around at different stations taking input uh, broadly from the public, including many of you. And then, uh, like I said, this committee met last March 6th, March 6th and we received uh, many different written comments. We've been uh, walking through those compiling, reviewing, drafting responses, and incorporating them ultimately to this general plan update. At the March meeting, <clears throat> we introduced this committee and the purpose of this general plan update. We talked about finding synergistic policies that can support one another. We talked about uh, the idea of uh, examining important trends and, and identifying gaps and filling those gaps in policy. Uh, we reviewed the structure of the element as it relates to air quality. Uh, greenhouse gases and energy are not explicitly addressed yet, so there wasn't really anything to go over on those topics in the existing element. Uh, we introduced the goals and we talked about um, how changes to state law affect what needs to be addressed in the general plan as it relates to greenhouse gases uh, in particular uh, and also air quality and energy. So I thought you would uh, appreciate some of the learning about some of the input that has been coming through to date uh, related to air quality, greenhouse gases and energy. There's support for avoiding mass grading uh, and removing topography for development like you see in so many places, support for tree preservation and even expanding the tree canopy, which can have air quality as well as greenhouse gas sequestration benefits. There's support for um, also, um, uh, oh, for a tree canopy, another benefit is that it can um, help to uh, provide benefits relative to her urban heat island, which uh, is uh, gonna become worse with climate change and then um, has negative feedback loop of uh, urban heat island, things get hotter, you use air conditioning more, that creates uh, more energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, and it's a vicious cycle. There's support for electric cars and expanding um, the infrastructure uh, and encouraging uh, the use of electric uh, vehicles, promoting the purchase of electric vehicles, even for the town to purchase electric, electric vehicles. Uh, uh, support for the idea of the town uh, adding more solar, uh, renewable energy generation facilities, promoting bicycle and pedestrian travel to reach important destinations, to identify uh, gaps in the bike ped network that exists today to important destinations, including downtown, and then address the gap in, the, in today's infrastructure, and to add destinations locally so that people don't have to drive so far to uh, Sacramento, to Roseville, to Rockland to reach destinations and services, therefore reducing vehicle trips, therefore reducing air pollutant emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there are folks that are worried about wildfires, wildfire safety with a changed climate. Support and concern both, but both sides. So support for expanding local housing choice uh, to increase the diversity of housing types and densities in, in the town, and also uh, concern about doing that exact same thing. We heard kind of uh, both sides of that, of course. Um, there's um, support finally for promoting incentives to convert wood burning stoves uh, to a cleaner burning alternative. So that's a, a wrap on kind of the basic input we've received to date, at least as of the writing of this presentation, I think more is rolling in all the time and we're sipping from a fire hose as we review those comments, actually. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to remind everybody, uh, you've seen this slide before of the you know, overarching approach to this general plan update, updating policies, 
uh, so that they're more relevant, identifying gaps, filling those gaps, uh, deleting policies or programs that aren't relevant any longer or have already been accomplished, things like that. We're also having an organizational part of this general plan update to align goals, objectives, and policies and implementation measures so they have consistent numbering and are grouped with one another, supportive of one another by topic, and then add objectives. I'll talk about what that means uh, in a minute. Um, add objectives where they weren't included before. This slide uh, explains some of these terms, and D David kind of brought this up uh, last time. You know, it takes uh, some expertise, uh, takes a lot of experience to understand how to write an effective policy that's going to be both clear enough to have meaningful results and also flexible enough to um, support a long range plan that's supposed to be good for 10 or 20 years. So just a, a little primer on what these things are. Goals are just an expression of a future desired state. Objectives are a way to measure um, how, how close you're getting to that goal along the way. Usually measurable, uh, objectives are a measurable outcome so that you can check in once a year and say, are we getting to our goal or not? Or do we need to course correct in order to get there? Policies are a simple statement of commitment to a course of action or a statement of a position. Uh, they're used as a decision-making guide for new projects, for public investments and, and other decisions. And then finally, implementation measures are action steps, policies, or sorry, they're procedures, they're programs, they're actions that are taken to implement policies. It's like a to-do list for staff over the course of uh, build out of the general plan. So with all of that in mind, I wanted to have a quick review of existing goals and policies and talk a little bit about considerations for making updates to this part of the general plan. We're asking ourselves these sorts of questions that I brought up earlier. And first with uh, the goal that right now that addresses this subcommittee's uh, uh, jurisdiction uh, goal number three in the natural resources, oh, that should say conservation of resources element. Uh, goal number three is to help protect groundwater and air quality within the Sacramento region. Um, so here might be worth thinking about whether to have goals for each individual resource area. Maybe there's a goal that addresses air, air pollutant emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. Maybe there's, there's a separate goal or goals for dealing with groundwater and surface water quality. Um, that it's just easier to track progress if a goal tries to deal with a single topic or two very closely related topics. Also might wanna think about uh, having goals that address the, these missing areas, greenhouse gases and energy, and think about opportunities for objectives. Um, so uh, if a goal is um, reduce local greenhouse gas emissions consistent with the uh, state legislative framework. Uh, an objective might be over the next five years, reduce uh, mobile source greenhouse gas emissions by 10% per capita or something like that. Just an example, I'm not saying I'm suggesting that necessarily. Um, also, there are opportunities to add here implementation measures, actions that are taken over time in order to move toward air quality, GHG energy goals. This probably difficult to read slide uh, lays out uh, the existing uh, policies. They're, they're um, truncated here, so this isn't the full policy, but it gives you the idea of what's in the existing conservation resources element related to air quality. We have policies about uh, minimizing uh, emissions during construction, um, about requiring air quality analysis for new development projects and even specifically requiring carbon monoxide modeling, uh, dispersion modeling and concentrations exposure analysis for development projects. There's a policy having to do with uh, reducing emissions using that analysis to reduce emissions through the uh, review of development projects by conditioning those projects. And then there's a, there's a threshold in here for doing air quality studies, very low threshold. If emissions could exceed 10 pounds per day in any type of uh, air pollutant emission, then conducted air quality analysis and submit it to the air district for review. There's a policy here about um, having local employers encourage flex time 
as a means of reducing peak morning afternoon trips that would potentially also reduce total trips uh, on a given day. Policy about preserving and planting trees. I mentioned the co-benefits, uh, the benefits relative to greenhouse gas emissions and air quality and energy on that topic before. And then finally, uh, this is kind of the big picture one, to phase and coordinate large residential projects with employment generating projects. So they happen together in tandem and the concept um, I'm sure behind that is um, there's a better uh, relationship between local housing and the occupations of local residents and then the jobs that are offered by uh, local employment development projects so that people can uh, walk or bike to work, take transit more easily or other or reduce the uh, length of their vehicle trips and reaching uh, their workplace. So here are some considerations. This is not all of them, but um, maybe think about clarifying the goal, the goals listed in, in blue, blue here, um, not just um, moving toward uh, attainment, but uh, perhaps there might be other goals that might have more residents uh, locally, like promote the public health through reducing air, air pollutant emissions or uh, promote public health, environmental health, whatever it is. Um, here, thinking about repeating existing requirements as policy. So what I mean is um, a lot of areas that we treat in a general plan are, are already uh, regulated. There's already a law that deals with something. That law exists, compliance is mandatory. So is it really necessary to repeat that thing in your general, in your local policy document? If it already exists, it's already required. Maybe we confine ourselves to policies that are within the discretion of, of Loomis for this general plan update. Um, another consideration is that screening level, 10 pounds per day, that's too low. If you're going to establish some level over which air quality analysis and reporting is, is needed, you want probably some projects to be below that threshold. <laughs> you know, 10, I probably admitted 10 pounds per day walking around the house uh, of air pollutant emissions. Uh, that's that's uh, really, really low. Um, let's see another consideration. Oh yes, uh, carbon monoxide mo modeling. I mentioned that there's a policy uh, requiring carbon monoxide dispersion modeling. Based on vehicle technology improvements, um, that's not needed anymore. Their uh, carbon monoxide hotspots are, are a public health concern, but it takes um, about 45,000 cars per hour at an intersection <laughs> uh, to create a carbon monoxide hotspot because vehicles are just so much better now. So there's not the need for that kind of policy direction any longer. Um, so thinking about, as we talked about last time, air pollutant emissions and GHG and energy, actually, transportation is the top source of emissions, the top user of energy. So um, we might think about in air quality GHGs to cross-reference or to reference uh, policies that might exist in other elements like land use or circulation that reduce uh, the need for vehicular travel. Um, that last policy phasing and coordinating large residential projects with employment projects i think enforceability there might be kind of a, an issue if um, a project is submitted and it complies with uh, local policies and is consistent with zoning then it might be pretty difficult to say well but hold on uh, large residential project we don't have a matching employment project yet to go with you so you might um, for that reason reconsider that kind of policy and then finally, uh, the opportunity to perhaps have policy that uh, relates to um, avoiding exposure to substantial pollutant concentrations. So maybe along the, the interstate or, or to have policies that would guide uh, since the development of sensitive uses at certain distances from the interstate since we know that that's a, an area of concentrated uh, diesel uh, truck movements. So moving on to considerations, um, for what would be new policy areas addressing greenhouse gas emissions uh, and energy. We might think about the framework being consistency with the state's GHG reduction targets, but in a way that makes sense 
uh, locally for Loomis. Um, there's often a mistake that local governments make uh, in just mirroring the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. Well, those are developed at the state level and those targets include all emission sources and sequestration uh, in California. Marine vessels are not a big issue for Loomis. You know, the, uh, mining emissions are not an issue. So there's the need to translate the state uh, emissions reduction targets in a way that makes sense locally. Uh, perhaps consider providing some policy guidance that would describe how the town will uh, condition projects under the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, CEQA, as uh, development projects come to the town. Maybe perhaps we have policy or guidance in the general plan EIR about how, uh, how the town's gonna treat uh, uh, development projects as they come in relative to the CEQA obligations. Uh, I mentioned uh, having a focus on reducing vehicular travel since that's the top source of emission and top uh, user of energy. Um, perhaps think about highlighting the co-benefits um, for public health, for household budgets, for uh, fiscal uh, sustainability. So, you know, what I mean there is basically everything a local agency does to reduce greenhouse gas emissions also has public health benefits. Even if you don't care about GHG emissions or climate change at all, everything you do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, can improve the public health, reduces household transportation budgets, um, can reduce business related uh, utility costs, um, can have many other um, fiscal benefits, can have uh, other co-benefits. So that might be worth considering to have some kind of discussion that correlates these related items. Um, also might wanna bear in mind uh, various court decisions, I guess in the sequel realm here again, that uh, relate to greenhouse gas emissions, air quality and energy. Um, like all of you, uh, I study all uh, precedent court decisions on environmental law in California and uh, have an encyclopedic knowledge. <laughs> but uh, perhaps we can uh, start. We have beginning. We're beginning to understand what uh, the Environmental Quality Act seems to require of projects and plans on these, you know, somewhat uh, dynamic topics. And I think it's worthwhile to consider that as we develop policy. On to energy. I wonder if there could be policy that um, provides guidance for um, for lower density developments on making use of passive solar, of being designed and oriented so that uh, there's less of a need for artificial cooling and heating during uh, certain parts of the year. Um, again, focusing on reducing vehicular travel since that's the top energy user. Uh, again, sequel guidance on um, energy related impacts and this is a, a this is an important one because uh, that's an emerge that's a highly dynamic issue in in case law <clears throat> and i think there's some uh, fairly bad law out there but i think that there is the opportunity for the town to say well here's how we think about analyzing energy related impacts within our CEQA documents um perhaps uh, measures that could be taken in collaboration with SACOG or other regional partners to, uh, to speed the uptake of electric vehicles, if that's a desire in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and air pollutant emissions locally. Partnerships to develop solar. Um, for a while, uh, the market was sort of saturated, but I'm starting to see a lot more energy, pardon the pun, around solar uh, installations. Uh, perhaps that, uh, would make sense locally. And then um, think about policy that offers some general guidance for siting of renewable energy facilities like solar and uh, wind. So with that giant mouthful of considerations, I move on to our next steps here. Um, you can continue to review uh, the existing um, element as well as the settings. We already have received a really good feedback on the settings and, and we'll be making revisions there. Uh, review uh, the existing element. Let, let me know um, uh, your policy ideas through that G, GPU, GP update uh, email address that you see in the lower part of this slide. Matthew, your considerations around air quality are totally off base. However, I have these considerations and inputs in, into how the policy framework should look in the future. And then 
uh, please attend uh, our next meeting we where we will go over some of those proposed revisions on June 3rd. Uh, thank you for uh, enduring that short presentation and I'll, I'll pass it back uh, to the chair at this point. I guess it'd be wise to unmute myself before I start running my mouth. So, <laughs> okay, so now we can open it up for the committee to uh, ask questions or make any comments, um, ask Matthew or staff what, uh, what we can do. Anybody raise your hand, show of hands, come on. David, go right ahead. Uh, so you had mentioned something about um, making different individual goals for the greenhouse gas, the energy, the water. Uh, I'm not opposed to that, but what I feel like we've been told this whole time was we're trying to co coordinate as make goals and kind of shrink them down to the fewest number as possible so that it's less work for you know, the town staff. And so I'm wondering if there's, if there really is a reason to separate them or should we uh, try to keep them just to, more together so that we don't have to worry about the, the extra work we're giving everybody else. If I could, David, we're not looking at shrinking the goals and, and consolidating them uh, because the goals and objectives and policies help the staff actually review projects. So in some ways we need more clarity. So in this case, breaking them down, we can then refer to an air quality goal policy implementation measure uh, a lot easier when we're reviewing projects. So okay. we don't want to duplicate these things. So in the case of some of, say, trails, you know, there is a reason for air quality GHG to have trails, have bicycles, whatever. But the actual designation is probably going to be in the circulation element. So there'll be a section will introduce. So the, the element introduces, you know, the, um, the conservation resources and then said, here are relevant goals, policies, implementation measures in other sections that are applicable to this, but they're covered there. So we're not duplicating those. Um, so clarity is really, I tell you, when we're reviewing projects, clarity and information is really helpful. So I guess right, then I would support can, Matthew in breaking it down. I can say that sounds fine to, to break them up, to me at least. Um, and then you said there's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things you talked about, but the, the only one other thing I've picked up I was um, the you said we don't want to repeat policies I miss do you need our guidance to tell you not to do that <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, no. do we need to say that no you don't have to say that we're it seems that's like that should be something that's okay yeah that's our job to, to not repeat it but right. what we need you to do is, is describe hey are we on the right path did Matthew you know are we on the right path are there things that have not come up that should be considered and, and definitely at the next meeting, when you actually see the goals and policies in legislative mode, you know, the, that's where the rubber is hitting the road. And, and definitely we want your input there. But okay. tonight, are we on the right direction? Has Matthew made the right interpretation? And are there things that we should be considering that we haven't? So, so one thing, and I, I, I want to bring it up in every meeting, is we need to look at opportunities for collaboration because the town of Loomis doesn't have a whole lot of money. So opportunities for collaboration, opportunities for incentives to make things happen rather than just a regulatory don't do this. So think about policies that might be incentivize people uh, to do these things. So a couple of things to, to think about as we talk about this element. Okay. Uh, there was a couple of other comments that I had submitted. I'm assuming you either haven't gotten to them or you just said they were bad idea <laughs> that I had submitted to the actual update. Uh, but it was one of them was actually to include uh, climate change as one of the as one of the goals, which is I don't need this is that a it didn't seem like that's something you 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 touched on. Um, and then a lot of the other things that I had suggested for that kind of feed into these other energy or water or like that. But one of the things that Marine brought up last time was um, carbon offsets for development or construction projects. And I'm wondering if that's something that you thought about and said no, or is that something that you didn't, 
you didn't, we haven't gotten to that part yet or, or where does that stand? Um, I didn't gloss over that because I, I have some kind of opposition or that it wouldn't be appropriate in certain situations. Um, you know, it's uh, more like I had uh, about this much time and this many things could fit in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got it. Uh, I think that's uh, mostly because because then you probably read all my other comments and you'll get to them eventually. Then. Okay, thanks. And, and just so the committee knows, I think we're up and over 700 comments so far and we have them in a document and we're really hopeful, Christy, you can tell me, but I think we're within just a few days of publishing that document. We haven't responded to every comment, but at least you can see all the comments. And as we respond to it, it'll be like, this has been addressed here, this has been addressed there. You know, so our intent is to tell you where we've been, with, you know, how we're dealing with these comments. Um, and I know today on the social pinpoint site, I downloaded a whole bunch of comments that just went out to the team today. So it's, it, like you said, they're coming in on a daily basis. Uh, can, I, can I make one suggestion about that? I mean, it's more, okay. I'm just adding more work for you, but okay. can you separate them out into ones that have been addressed and ones that have not been addressed yet? Is it possible to do that easily? That way I know what, which ones I can, don't, I have to worry about, you've addressed these, okay, that's fine, I don't have to worry about those. These you haven't addressed, I have to, I have to okay. do them. Okay, they're going to be sorted by date. And then there is a response column. So you can take a look in the response column if there's any new response. So I just have to scroll through with it. Okay, you right, have to but, but it's by date. So you can kind of quickly, hopefully quickly. Through. You yeah. could also sort by your name. So ah. your comments are by your name. Um, so that's one way you could find yours in particular. Um, and just so you know, we are reviewing them as they come in. It just takes a little while to get it into the spreadsheet. And but it's, it's not. Are you publishing a spreadsheet or are you just publishing the, a PDF, like a, a printout of the spreadsheet? I, I can't remember. I think it's an, you know, I think we're doing a PDF of the spreadsheet, but there's That's no it. reason we couldn't do the spreadsheet to allow the sorting. We have that ability to sort because we are sorting. But, uh, you could do so a search through the PDF. We could, yeah, we could do that too. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment about, uh, Anders' point about partnering with some of, and I think Matthew, you talked about this too, like uh, the APCD, Placer County APCD, they have uh, Carl Moyer funding grants that you can apply for, the town can apply for, for electric vehicles. Uh, they've reached out to the school districts to, for clean air buses, and even in Roseville, they they uh, retrofitted the air filtration system of the elementary schools down there as well. So there is funding and we can reach out to them. And today I received a email from Pioneer Energy talking about, uh, I, I don't quote me on this, but I thought it said 1.7 million or something like that in funding for uh, charging stations that would be available to uh, local governments here in Placer County, many counties. So there are ways that uh, we can partner since we do not have that money to, to get access to these uh, funds. And I don't know how we can incorporate that. That's why we have you guys to tell us how we can incorporate that. And actually, uh, I was just thinking that what we should do is have a, a policy or an implementation measure to collaborate and look for funding. But Christy, I'm thinking in volume two, is we actually have a list that we can update as needed, uh, a list of potential funding sources such as that, that I wasn't aware of and, and just list them so that we're aware of them. And, and the reason for that, Jeff, is volume one is a general plan, only can update it four times a year. Volume two, you can update it as often as you want, the way we've set it up. It's just an informational document. So I've got a question at some point about uh, you know, funding and an opportunity for capturing some funds. Yeah. And it has to do with uh, carbon capture and carbon trading. So when corporations, you know, buy credits for carbon offsets because that, they can't meet their carbon goals, where doesn't this money go into a, like a mitigation bank for carbon? And if that's so, 
do we have opportunity to access those funds? Did you guys all hear that? You mean, you mean uh, if the town developed carbon uh, um, greenhouse carbon well, uh, reducing projects, could you sell credits uh, to? No, no. I'm saying if companies they buy credit by paying money. So what if we want to fund something, a project carbon reduction pro program, but we need money? Let's say we even for something is. Uh, like buying electric vehicles, can we access those funds? And I have a project in mind. So, uh, and I don't know, Andrews is, is laughing because maybe he read my comment already, I don't know. But uh, it has to do, my project, my thought was I, I, yeah. I submitted a comment, you're muted, Andrews. No, oh, I'm, uh, I'm on now again. Okay, yeah, I had, I had an idea and it's, it's a conversation I wanted to start and I, wrote a letter and I submitted to, to the general plan update uh, website or to the email. And it has to do with uh, school busing. And it's something I've been thinking about and I have talked to some people for a long time and it's kind of a stretch, but I think we should probably start the conversation. And where I'm going is one of the problems in Loomis, not only in terms of carbon production, but traffic is huge, is all the parents uh, driving their kids to and from school. we got two schools within a mile of each other. And so we have two mass events every day uh, coming and going to school that's clogging up our roads and everything. And so the solution would be, and we've done it in the past and everybody knows, school busing used to be publicly funded and it was a very successful program and all the kids rode the bus. And uh, so probably because of ta uh, Prop 13 and other reasons, we've lost the public funding and the schools were going around and my, when my kids were little, they got to the point where they were gonna charge five, $600 a year to for your kids to ride the bus. So a lot of the parents now have moved into driving the cars and now that's just become the norm in the way of life where every, most parents uh, you know, drive their kids to and from school every day. And so if the problem is funding, my thought was, can we capture some of those, some money from the carbon, carbon offsets that corporations might be paying into like the mitigation bank, like we do for uh, tree mitigation, park mitigation, things like that. You set, you pay money and then you use it elsewhere. So kind of there it is. Uh, and I, I know that's a stretch and people are gonna go, oh, no, no, we don't wanna do that and this, that and the other can't do it. I really believe that we need to start the conversation and maybe over time it might get some, uh, some traction. Uh, you know, the schools come to the town often and they ask for funds for the tennis courts and all these wonderful things this that and the other, maybe it's getting to the point where we need to ask them to help us because we're telling, well, we're spending all our money on in widening the roads to accommodate your transportation just problems that you're causing for us. So with all that, I'll let some people jump in if they like. Go real ahead, Andrew, you've been Yeah, real quickly, Greg, you know, the, the comments are in, we're going to consider them as part of the general plan update, but my recommendation to get the conversation going is go to the social pinpoint and put it on the ideas page because it then allows people to add to the discussion. And uh, I think that would be the best format to begin your discussion. Okay, you said the social ideas page? Social, social, pin, pinpoint. social pinpoint. So. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so All very right. best at the end of this meeting, we'll briefly describe it, but the ideas page is a really good place to put that information, Greg. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chairman Duncan, I have Lorraine Thiebaud uh, waiting in the wings. Yes, Go ahead, Lorraine. Lorraine. Go ahead. Um, actually, the school bus proposal sort of triggered what I was gonna be talking about just a little bit, uh, at least one of the issues, which was uh, there's very little carpooling organization for the schools. Um, which I think should be a first step towards uh, reducing traffic through the center of town for the two schools. Uh, I also see lots of high school students who uh, drive cars alone, and I think they should be charged a parking fee if they don't have at least two to three other students in the car with them uh, in order to reduce the amount of traffic there. Um, I think in terms of partnerships, it would be advantageous for uh, representatives from Loomis to meet with 
the three um, legislative representatives and ask them. Uh, they have staffs that uh, can help us find funding. Uh, I think that would be to our advantage and make things a lot faster than trying to find all that funding by ourselves, um, as well as their ability to propose funding sources that might assist small communities. Um, my concerns uh, that you brought up about passive solar is as a nurse, I'm very concerned about uh, increased heat events in the summertime in um, this area. And which means I think we should focus on um, passive cooling as well as active cooling. Things that I would consider is increasing the tree canopy by increasing the number and types of trees that we protect because the number of oaks are diminishing because of climate change, but we should be planting and uh, encouraging other types of trees that will do better in the heat here and protect them because that's one. Um, I think we need to consider permanent shade um, structures over schools for uh, public uh, activities areas and for all parking lots, certainly in terms of um, anything like Costco coming in. The, um, areas like in Arizona where people have to walk long distances across parking lots, cause people to get sick and faint and get very ill. And when you consider that the most in danger from heat events are children, uh, the elderly and pregnant women that have serious health consequences, I think we need to look more actively at what kind of shade do we have. Um, my daughter actually graduated from <laughs> um, Del Oro High School the year that the graduation was canceled at nine o'clock in the morning <laughs> because it was 105 by that time and the ambulance had been to the school over six times to take away people who had fainted from heat prostration and that whole area was none of it was covered people were expected to sit in front of plastic grass in a sunny area and when the event was canceled, we were all expected to walk across the school through heated parking lots and back to cars that were in my case, 140 degrees with my mother who was 99. So I think we need to consider more actively what kind of shade we're providing um, so that people don't have to do that. I also see at the Loomis Grammar School, they have the entire play yard is completely uncovered. There's no place for children to play on a hot day where they don't have to play in direct sunlight or, uh, in the activity area. Um, I'd also like to consider the possibility that Loomis would eliminate all burn days and somehow um, institute a chipping service uh, in combination, which would charge a fee, but the chipping service was largely eliminated because it was run with the prisoners. Um, and since a lot of them were released during COVID, that service went by the by. So, um, I think we need to consider reducing burn days because of the high amount of particulate matter that we have in this area uh, that specifically affects lung disease and um, heart disease. Um, I know another particular concern for me is what's happening throughout the state of California, which is the electrification program, which is building all new housing without gas lines in order to discourage people from using gas. Um, which both causes people to be breathing gas in their homes and to be burning it and in increasing um, air pollution and climate change. Um, the other thing I think in terms of encouraging uh, the use of electric cars is that all new homes should have um, 220 outlets in the garage area so that people can be parking. Uh, their electric cars. I think in the next 20 years with companies like GM saying they're not gonna be producing gas powered cars anymore, new construction needs to take into account immediately that most people want to be plugging in their cars at home and not necessarily parking at Rayleigh's. Uh, so those are some of mine. Um, I, I do agree with the issue of electric powered buses though, if that's possible. Thanks for your time. Thanks Lorraine. Mary Beth, we have uh, anyone else hands up? David? Yeah, so uh, I was unaware the chipping service had gotten canceled. I use them all the time. I used to use them all the time. I had needed them recently. Uh, but that was a Placer County pro project and it's, that is, it's I, back I would, again. what, say again? It's back again, $80 an hour. 
Okay, so it is back. Okay, I was gonna say if that that's something I don't think that's something that Loomis would be able to tackle on their own, but definitely something we could coordinate with the county. But if it's already back, then we don't have to worry about that. Uh, a lot of the other things um, that people have been mentioning, oh, I talked with with are very closely related to the schools, uh, and we have no real authority over them. Uh, and so I'm, we should definitely, definitely be working with, part, with uh, partnering with the school district on the busing and getting shade structures. And, but we, I don't think the town, I think even if we offered to pay for it, I don't, I'm not sure that they would put it in because I just don't think they, they have the desire for that. Uh, with the busing, I talked to Gordon, but I actually brought up the, the almost the exact same thing. I said, we just need more buses. And, and I talked to him and he shot it down immediately, but he was, he was completely uninterested in that at all. And he said, he said, we don't have the money done, end of conversation. And so as I, I think if we can somehow, it, 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 it should be easy for us to find with all of the money that's out there to find something that some federal program or some state program that allows that it says, look, we're gonna limit our air pollutants by 30% if we start busing you know, if we start a busing program, it's, it's something that the town can facilitate, I guess, through the school district, especially considering that the school district has no, no desire at all. I think that's something that we should, we, we don't necessarily like that. We don't have to pay for it, but we can at least point the school district in the right direction. Say, look, this is the stuff we should be doing. We want you to do for our, for our citizen. Um, and same, same thing with this, the parks and the trails, safe route to schools. That's kind of a, that's definitely something else that the, the schools should be doing on their own, but they are again, not doing, but I think if the town kind of, if we can at least give some push to them, say, this is what we want. Maybe they'll take us a little more seriously considering that all of their, all of their mo most of, the of their students are our residents. So. Okay, that's it, thanks. Okay. Any other committee comments? Raise your hand. Are we still waiting on public participation or? We, we still have no public participation, unfortunately. Yeah, that is unfortunate. Um, it's not as exciting as, uh, you know, housing. Circulation. <laughs> even, even though it could be related to housing and how we build things and, and all that. So, but, um, okay, well, oh, Maureen, go ahead. Yeah, I've got something related to housing and uh, reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, Sacramento is um, looking to pass a bill this fall that would allow duplexes, triplexes, and apartment buildings in areas that are solely zoned for single family. And the reason they're doing that is to obviously cut down on, um, or to add housing, to cut down on um, greenhouse gases and uh, just make it more user-friendly, basically. And I think, I think we should do that because um, it's, um, you know, they'll, there's, a wall that joins each of the homes. There's a common wall, and um, it just limits um, construction costs at the same time, uh, helping with the greenhouse gas situation. And they they can be very lovely, and they yeah. prob probably be in neighborhoods that um, more affordable. Yeah. Well, that's. That's one of the, well, we have that mixed use project that's going in that has some duplexes and uh, carriage houses. So we're not opposed to that. It's just whether the developer that and the property owners that are developing the land, what they want to build there. So it's the, up to them? Yeah, I mean, until we get the inclusionary rule in that you know, talks about maybe putting in, I, I know what type of duplexes you're talking about. I've seen those pictures where, you know, on corners where you cannot tell the difference, yeah. whether it's a house or, or not. Uh, those are really nice looking places. And I've seen back in the, you know, uh, 
even Victorian homes turned into fourplexes back east were right. very nice and, and you know efficient and everything. Now I'm not sure Anders, you know, they were talking about isn't there a law that's been passed with new uh, uh, housing development that they're supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, energy efficient and isn't solar so supposed to be on new homes now? I believe under the building code, that's correct. Okay. So, you know, we're headed in that, that right direction. And, and to Lorraine's point is uh, regarding trees, that is a, a real big concern. And I think Gene Wilson pointed it out, you know, very well that, you know, if we do higher density homes, you know, we kind of lose the ability to get this type of shade trees that we would need. And then you have those heat pockets and then you're using more um, uh, air conditioning. And it's kind of like a vicious uh, circle that, you know, uh, we continue to, you know, hurt ourselves. So it's all related somehow. And it's up to uh, Anders and Matthew and the team, all, everyone to kind of lead us in the right direction, I suppose, so. <laughs> and just so you know, the discussion uh, has been at the housing committee uh, regarding the duplexes and changing the code to allow that. And it's also been brought up at the uh, land use committee. So, uh, you know, from the notes tonight, based on what you said, we'll pass those on to those two committees for consideration. Very good. But, but as Matthew, you know, goals policies uh, for um, greenhouse gas and other conservation, it's probably worthwhile to note that there are some strategies in the zoning code, the land use code that would, you know, um, go towards that end. So that those become supportive policies of the land use. I like the idea of, of separating, you know, air from water. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, there was one, one other comment, just piggybacking on what Maureen was saying, and that is with, with all of the other elements that we have, there are a lot, there are many of those goals and policies, or not goals, but they're policies and implementation measures that directly affect greenhouse gases and energy. And, and it would be, I, I, must, I think you said you were going to reference them here as well. So it would, it, it would, it would be relatively quick and again more adding more work for you guys but relatively quick to go through them and just say this is something that's going to reduce greenhouse gas let's just reference it and I mean just go through all of the existing policies there can't be more than I don't know a hundred <laughs> there's more than a hundred policies there could be one we're done oh when we're done yeah okay yeah so yeah so but if we if we as we're as everybody else is writing them it's just it's it's pretty it's fairly easy just to say, is this, can this be applied to circulation or can this be applied to greenhouse gases? And that's just something that I'm assuming you're doing anyway. But we if not, it's something that daily. should be. Yeah. Yeah. There are calls on a daily basis. Where does this go and how do we divide it up? So yeah, that is okay. going on. Yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, good. Uh, Maureen, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think we should coordinate with the electric car companies um, and um, set up a booth at the eggplant festival or any other event that we have just to promote electric cars yeah, and get, I, get the community involved. I'm sure Tesla wouldn't mind that. I, I yeah. received an email just a couple of days ago from one of their uh, people about the supercharger site at Rayleigh's. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Like, well, I wasn't aware of that. No, I saw it being built. So, yeah. so that's good. You know, I know that. And to, I can't remember if it was you or Lorraine that said something about having the 220 volts put in. One of the biggest reasons people return their electric vehicle is because they don't have the proper charging uh, apparatus in their home. It's not that they don't like their car. It's just that they can't charge it enough at home. You know, you have to have the proper um uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, battery pack, or or you have to have the proper charging device and and everything. So, so those are some of the things we we, we can think about. But in the meantime, uh, Mary Beth, what's your recommendation about the pinpointing that? Yeah, if you haven't yeah, seen that, David that, or Greg. That's really cool. The Pinpoint pro program? Social pinpoint. And let me take you on a brief tour here. Oh, 
Oops. Okay, so this is our Town of Loomis homepage. And on every page throughout these pages, these things are stagnant. They're always up here. So social pinpoint is first. And what social pinpoint is, is that interactive mapping tool. <clears throat> so you just click on social pinpoint, it takes you to here. It gives you a little intro about how to use it, why to use it. And then you click here to begin the journey. You go to the next page and you get our mission statement. We've talked about that. And then are there things that you want to change even with the mission statement? Um, we haven't had anybody respond on that one. So I think we're pretty good shape on, on our mission still. Um, and as you scroll down, you get, this is what Andy was referring to Greg to was the ideas wall. So there, there are little markers up here that if you wanna share an experience, tell us what's working well, businesses you want locally and things to improve on. So as you can see, the blue color pops up blue boxes, you know, this corresponding colors. So somebody writes a comment, they even provided pictures. Um, the comment is trails throughout Loomis. While people may disagree on a lot of things, one thing we all agree and love is the natural rural beauty of the town we live in. So they provided a picture that goes along with that, which is pretty cool. The town staff replies, this comment will be provided to the town council planning commission, appropriate general plan committee, general plan technical staff and town staff for consideration in preparing the general plan update. So this is where we're taking that comment out, putting it in our master spreadsheet and carrying it forward through the committees uh, clear up to the end. As you can see here, you can start a discussion on it. You see people like it. We don't have any dislikes, so at least one person liked it. But if you feel the same way about any of these things, you can reply to that and keep that conversation going so it stays encapsulated in one area with the main comment going on. We had a thing about um, entertainment and, uh, you know, again, somebody put a little picture of the way things used to be. <laughs> <laughs> so a very cool ideas wall. If you go back to the ideas wall, uh, underneath that, are the various elements of the general plan. So land use and housing, you can navigate to the map. Here again, you have little markers. If your comment's gonna to apply to land use or you're just making a comment or possibly a housing opportunity, you use those markers. And as you see, people are putting stuff on our little map. Why is Loomis wanting to build so much housing right at the freeway? So I, I, that's referring to, and um, as you can see, oh, I can't move that box. You know, one trick is go over to where it says activity. You can see all the boxes pop up, Marika. Oh. Yep, okay. there they go. So you can just scroll through all the comments. Okay, cool. Very I, have, best. I haven't been very interactive in this yet. So, but as you can see, you can blow up the map and totally pinpoint <clears throat> your comment and where it needs to be. Cool. Mary Beth? Yes. Can you use the uh, cut and paste feature for this on this? Like if I have my comment, which is, I rather than retype it all, can I just cut and paste it in? Um, you you okay. can do that. I, I tried it. Yeah. You I can? Cutting, yeah, I was cutting and pasting today, so yeah. Great, thank you. And that's how we got the same comment in all of the little boxes, so. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And, and just so you know, the intent is as we fill out the large comment box, if we have specific responses, they'll be put into here also and just added to that comment. But uh, we wanted to let people know we've downloaded the comment, it's going into the master list, and the technical team is beginning to respond. So we have an area for conservation of resources that lumps everything all right there. You navigate to the map and make your comments on that. Historic, cultural, air, GHG, biological, open space, natural resources. Um, okay. Hello. Oh, hi there. Hi. I just got off some supplies. 
Yeah, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> so no, nobody's made any comments here on, on this particular item, but if you were to, we're at least showing you where all the waterways are. We weren't able to overlay this on this map, so we put it side by side just so we could see the areas of um, water drainage and things like that. So a very cool uh, interactive tool. Everything that you could ever want can be on here and uh, feel free to play and explore and put your comments where they belong. It helps us a lot in trying to sift them out too, but as we know, one comment can go five different ways. So, <laughs> Do you, how, how long has this been up? Uh, since uh, a, April 22nd. And do you have a rough estimate of how many comments you've had so far? Um, Andy? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about 30. Oh, okay. So the word's getting out. Word's yeah. getting out. And, Good. And with these committee meetings, we're sharing it with committee members. And any public presentations we're doing or anything, we always plug it. So, <laughs> so do we have a committee assignment? Do I have to prove that I was able to navigate the pinpoint? Because uh, it makes me nervous. <laughs> yes, Jeff, we're going to have we're going to expect a demonstration from you next month. <laughs> and, we, and we expect to see great comments up there real soon. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it'll I be nominate there. Stephanie to do that. All over, all over the place. Oh heck no! <laughs> I nominate you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. No, I'm delegating that to you, David. That's right. You nominated David for enough stuff last night. Sorry. Uh, keep it coming. Time. <laughs> the one thing it does ask you when you leave comments is for an email address or a name or something like that. So you're anonymous to the public as they're using it, but you're not anonymous, anonymous no. to us on this side. <laughs> so I can leave David's email. <laughs> I, and I just hope it... The old fashioned way of GP update at lumis.ca.gov for your comments. So, yeah. <laughs> I hope, I just hope it doesn't turn into another Facebook. <laughs> yeah. It has that ability. We can take that dislike button off of there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we, we, do, we do have the ability to uh, moderate this. There, there's actually a little, a little switch I can throw. If there's bad words, it takes them out. <laughs> Very good. good. We, we good. will be monitoring this on a daily basis. And bad people. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's for another committee. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, uh, Matthew and Suzanne. Um, I guess our next meeting will be June third, and at seven p.m. All right. Look forward to it. And thanks for everybody's participation. Thanks, Mary Beth, for the pinpoint. Uh, Social pinpoint. Social. Yeah, Trouble with that word, social. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. And we'll adjourn the meeting at 8.08. .08. Thank you, Jeff. Good job. Good night, all. Thank Good you, job, everybody. Bye.